Notebook 4, Towards the Lorette Charnel House, from the 23rd of December 1914 to the 2nd of June 1915, Part 1. It was the 23rd of December 1914, and after a week of exhausting work day and night without sleep or shelter, the soldiers could barely recognize one another. But finally they were relieved and were led to the reserve trenches. Here, the previous occupants had had the idea of setting up shelters that could hold two or three men each, and even included beds of straw, a luxury they had not experienced for a long time. This allowed the Poilus to finally stretch out, take off their shoes and not be on constant alert. Barthas remarked that in misery, even the slightest comfort and tiniest well-being became huge deals strokes of incredibly good fortune, and they were ready to take any opportunity that appeared before them. During that night, while they rested, ten demoralized Germans came to the French lines in their sector to surrender. They were taken by the 17th Company, and it was a huge event because these were the first prisoners captured by the regiment. The following night was Christmas Eve, and as soon as dark arrived, the soldiers huddled in their holes, enjoying the thought of finally sleeping until dawn. But at nine o'clock, a harsh voice passed orders to immediately get out of the holes and hoist their packs with all speed. Something unusual was happening across the front line. Songs, shouts and laughter emerged from the darkness, and many flares were fired on both sides but there was no shooting at all. Two hours later, the alert was called off, and they did not receive any explanation about what had happened until the next day. In this part of the notebook, Barthas had placed a note, written by Captain Houdel, that explained more of this event. But it has been unfortunately lost, and so I do not know what it said. Still, it can be seen that this, in all probability, was part of the Christmas celebrations and truces that manifested in many sectors of the Western Front in 1914, better known simply as the Christmas Truce. However, this strange night seems to have been all the extent to which Barthas interacted with the Christmas Truce. When Christmas Day arrived, they received no holiday or relief. They were immediately put to work digging a big shelter that could hold the entire squad. Unfortunately, they would not enjoy the fruits of their labor, because their 48 hours of supposed rest, where they had done nothing but work and dig until the point of exhaustion, were over. Now they were due to leave for the front that very evening. Those five days in the front were five more days and nights of hard labor and watch duty, with no opportunity for rest or sleep, and where they had to either constantly move through the mud while being hit by incessant rainstorms, or shiver when the cold winds of the north were such that the ground would freeze solid and chill them to the very core. They finally returned to Anneka on January 1st, 1915, after a total of 17 days in the trenches, during which they couldn't shave or wash their hands once but they only stayed in the village for two days. The entire time was spent in distributions of equipment, drills and roll calls, and they did not even have the opportunity to wash their clothes and dry them out. All of them wondered if this horrible way of living was going to last much longer. Despite this, during these two days they still had some fun, for the people of Narbonne had been generous enough to send them some food and drink with which they could celebrate the new year. But still, by January 2nd, it was back on to the muddy path towards the trenches. That month of January would stand out in Barthus's memory for the particularly acute sufferings they had to live through. He said he wouldn't even try to describe what the trials that they had to go through were like only that he never thought the human body could endure so much. Almost every morning they were surrounded by dry white frost which formed icy stalactites 
that hung from their beards and mustaches and dreadfully chilled their feet. Then the temperature rose during the day and night, but this was no relief, as immediately the rain would come in a downpour and would fill the trenches with mud and water and turn them into rushing streams and canals. To endure the constant battle against fatigue, cold, sleeplessness, thirst and hunger, the men took to drinking huge amounts of a harmful alcohol that Barth has described as pure poison. It was brought by the rationers from Aneca, where the merchants sold it for little more than a franc per liter. The quality of the liquids in that cheap mixture was more than doubtful, but still some of the men got to the point of drinking a liter of that poison every day, while the most moderate drank a quarter or half a liter per day. Bartha says that if the military authorities hadn't called a halt to the traffic of this thing, the drinkers would have lost their minds from it. But time passed and finally on the 23rd of January they were sent to rest for the first time in Vermel, the town that had been previously occupied by the Germans and that was now in the hands of the French. Bullets whizzed by on the outskirts of the town, but for some strange reason it was very rare to see a shell fall within Vermel, despite it being well within view and range of the German batteries, and despite there being entire batteries of French 75s hidden within ruined houses, which fired every day. Because of this unusual situation, Bartha says that every time they went to Vermel for rest, they enjoyed complete safety. Still, the town of Vermel was in a pitiful state. The constant bombardments of the previous months had reduced it to ruins, and no house stood undamaged. Those buildings that were least deteriorated had immediately been occupied by all the big shots, with three or four gold stripes on their sleeves. The houses that were half demolished became the property of lowly adjutants and lieutenants, while the houses that had lost three quarters of their roofs, or one floor out of two, became the usual camping grounds for the squads of Poilus. That first night in Vermel, the 21st company was piled inside an abandoned ballroom. Barthes' squad, being the last one to arrive, had to take the only place left, a balcony where the orchestra had once played, and that was located rather high up. There was no ladder, so the balcony could only be reached through great acrobatic efforts. Bartha says that the balcony would have been comfortable for the five or six musicians that once played on it, but it was too narrow to serve as a bed for the sixteen of them, who in the end could not get any good sleep, despite sorely needing it, for fear of falling off and crashing down on those below them. The next day, the squad followed the law of first come, first served, and appropriated a house that looked rather comfortable to them. It seemed to have belonged to a well-off blacksmith, or maybe a saddle maker, because it had a workshop filled with tools. The roof had been blown almost entirely away by shell fire, but all the furniture was in place and practically intact. They discovered that this house had once been occupied by the Germans, who, after drinking all the wine in the cellar, had covered its floor with three layers of empty bottles, carefully placed one on top of the other to draw off the dampness. Then the Germans had added a thick layer of grain sheaves on top to serve as a soft bed, and brought down pillows and mattresses from the house and covered the walls with bed sheets. In this way, the Germans had turned the cellar into a very comfortable bedroom that the Poilus now enjoyed to its fullest. Barthas remarked that one slept very well indeed in the bed of their enemy. On the 25th of January, they were suddenly awoken by the quick firing of a neighboring battery of 75s that shook the entire house. They quickly got up and by instinct grabbed their packs and got out eager to know what was happening. It was an attack on the 295th regiment in the sector in front of Bethune, to their left. Apparently the German Kaiser himself was present, and, the 25th of January being his birthday, 
the German army wished to mark the day with a glorious deed. But, Bartha says, unfortunately for the Germans and fortunately for them, word of the attack had gotten around and the appropriate preparations had been made on the French side. At first, things were not looking good. The 295th had held its ground before the German attack, but the English, farther to the left, had been suddenly pushed back and a gap had opened up in their lines. But then, a battalion of territorials in reserve at the town of givenchy le lavaze put up a strong resistance and counterattacked energetically, retaking part of the lost ground. This action helped save Bethune, but Bartha's comments that it was mainly the batteries of 75s in Vermeer which broke the German attacks. Every time the Germans poured onto the Lille Bethune road, they were hit on the flanks and mowed down by the artillery. It was a massacre. The next day, some of the French soldiers went out to witness the depressing spectacle of thousands of broken bodies littering the fields, where the moans and cries of the dying could still be heard. Barthas decided not to go because he knew such a scene of horror would have given him several nights of nightmares. But time marched on, and on January 31st they went to Anaka for four days of rest. Each squad was going to reclaim its usual billet when they were suddenly received by furious townspeople. After the taking of Vermel, a large part of Anaka's inhabitants had returned, and when they noticed the looted and pillaged state of their houses, they were furious and accused the soldiers of it, calling them with many terrible names. Not feeling particularly charitable or friendly themselves, the Poilus placed all the blame on the English, who were also occupying part of the village. This lessened the villagers' resentment towards them a little. But from that day on, the soldiers had to camp in quarters of far less quality, that, Bartha says, were suitable only for parias from the trenches. The next day, Barthas was on guard duty at the town's police station when he saw 200 reinforcements march by. They had been sent from Narbonne by Manival. Among them, he had the happy surprise to see Louis Allard, a fellow Periasois. This contingent from Narbonne immediately received their baptism by fire for at that moment the Germans unleashed a volley of time-fused shells which damaged a couple of roofs and brought down some harmless tiles onto the terrified reinforcements. Luckily, they were only scared, and no one had the slightest scratch. Before they all headed for the front, Captain Houdel had the generous idea to offer a feast to their paid as comrades. They were reaching the end of it and were about to make a toast in honor to their distant hometown when an enormous explosion shook the entire house. Walls crumbled and windows shattered while pieces of metal and wood penetrated the furniture. It turned out that a monstrous shell had landed just beside the road at the corner of the Anakin Cemetery, which was across the house where they were having their feast. The shell had pulverized three tombs and its occupants, some bits of whom Barthas was sure had landed on their dinner table, along with all the dust, mud and powder, and left an enormous hole in the cemetery that could be seen for a long time afterward. Luckily, the shell had only killed men that were already dead, and it had fallen only at the end of their meal, but where one shell fell, it was likely to be followed soon by another, less inoffensive one. So all the men scattered as quickly as they could, and so ended their feast. On February 4th, they returned to the trenches along with their new comrade. There they found their friend, the school teacher Mondieu, who could not join them in the rest period because he had gotten punishment duty. It turned out that at the start of the war, their top leaders had come up with a nasty new way of punishing wrongdoers without putting them in prison. Now, when someone was punished, he had to stay up on the front lines, while the rest of the company rotated back for rest in the rear. 
and this was done for the same number of days as he would have served in jail. The punished man was ordered to do the same work details and guard duties as the rest of the frontline troops, though the replacements themselves generally did not go along with this, and let the punished man have a bit of rest on his own in the trench, as best as he could anyway. Bartha says that eventually this barbarous procedure would end, though it would be replaced with the disciplinary units. Reflecting on this, he wrote in his notebook how comfortable the gloomy and damp prisons and barrack cells would seem for soldiers in peacetime if they thought about the suffering and danger faced by the unhappy Poilus subjected to the hideous, brutal and despotic wartime discipline. Their friend Mondier was a true anti-militarist and completely despised his rifle, a tool meant for murder. He had treated his weapon with such negligence that he was lapped with eight days of this twisted punishment at the front lines. But time continued and eventually their trench duty got much better. They now spent two days on the front line, two days in reserve and four days in the rear, one time in Anneka and the next one in Vermel. Vermel was still deserted of its original inhabitants, because of the bullets and shelling that constantly threatened the area. Though it was curious that the inhabitants of the town of Philosoph, barely one kilometer away from Vermel, were far luckier. At Philosoph they did not suffer any shelling, and the people continued their activities as if nothing was happening. But it was said that the owners of the coal mine and the chateau there lived on the other side of the Rhine, and this seemed to explain everything. Another curious event during that time was that in the deserted grassy fields between Anneka and Vermel, one could see a flock of sheep appear each day, being led peacefully by an old shepherd, dressed in an ample old cloak, and who in retrospective, Bartha says perhaps was disguising his age. The Poilus were amazed by his carelessness at leading his sheep every day in the middle of a war zone but no one was going to bother an old man who apparently already had one foot in the grave. But the English were far less trusting than them, and they soon noticed that whenever one of their own batteries was put into place, the sheep came to graze nearby, arrayed in such a way that the Germans could fix their sights on the battery, and soon after, howitzer shells would start to fall around them. It was evident that the shepherd was a German spy, and so the English sent him off to spy into the next world. Among the damage that Shepard caused before his demise were some large caliber artillery pieces that had been installed with enormous effort by the French. Despite the pieces being very well hidden among the large slack heaps of Anakin, as soon as they were in place, they were destroyed by a violent German bombardment directed right at them. It was all a titanic exercise in futility, but it seemed that by this point the cannon builders no longer seemed particularly bothered by their wasted effort. What they built would eventually be destroyed. Another event that stood out in Barthes's mind was on February 20th, when they were resting at Anneka and were supposed to move up to the front line that very evening but in the afternoon there was a violent hailstorm with very strong winds and the communication trenches were filled with ice. So when evening came, they had to wade through the flooded trenches and they were soaked to the bone with freezing water. And this was not helped by the fact that they were already drenched in sweat. To Barthas it seemed that there really was a god for the Poilus who miraculously kept them from developing bronchitis head colds and other illnesses. When the freezing men reached the front line trench, Barthas, together with a comrade, was going to occupy his usual little cabin when he discovered that it had collapsed. This had been the only shelter he had to crawl into after the long hours of guard duty. Fortunately, in a neighboring dugout, some soldiers had a little fire going and they allowed Barthas to warm himself there else he feared that he would have died from the cold that very night. 
Two days later, Barthas, together with his squad, went on to the Vermel coal mine to gather up timber. At the point where the communication trench opened onto the railroad track, Barthas, feeling a bit tired, stopped and decided to wait for his comrades on the return trip. While waiting there, he started looking at some abandoned shelters before him. These shelters had been built on orders from the commandant of their battalion for his personal use. They had taken a lot of hard work with picks and shovels and plenty of requisition mine props. But once a few shells fell in the vicinity, the commandant and his entourage had immediately taken off and had other shelters built for themselves somewhere safer. For the high-ranking ones, manpower and materials cost nothing, except a few orders. Barthas was in front of the entrance to one of these empty, useless shelters, wondering how much wasted effort and fatigue they had cost, when a huge 105 mm shell arrived like a thunderbolt, brushed past his head, burst through the roof of the shelter, and exploded inside. Barthas had been extremely lucky. If the roof had given enough resistance for the shell to explode on top of it, his head would have been blown off. All Barthas got away with in this incident was a big scare, but it represented how death constantly hung over their heads, ready to mow them down when least expected, even in sectors that were considered calm like theirs. In the routine of trench life, what Barthas had gone through was just a small incident, and if he had been guillotined by that shell, everyone would have considered it perfectly natural. Then, on March 23rd, the 21st Company found itself at rest in Anneka, when their captain Houdel had the good idea of sending the company to visit the city of Bethune, which was famous among gourmets for its macaroons. Barthas comments that Bethune and Anneka were separated by barely six kilometers, something that should have been completely routine, but their legs were in such a bad shape and they were already so tired that when they returned in the evening, they were completely exhausted, as if they had had an incredibly long march. When the soldiers reached Bethune, they received an unpleasant surprise. The authorities did not allow them to enter the town, instead sending them off to a vast enclosure, where they were held like prisoners all day long. They were not trusted enough to be given a few hours of liberty, Though, at least, they did authorize each squad to assign two men to go into town to look for provisions for themselves and their comrades. From that day on, access to Bethune would be forbidden for companies. Barthas did not know the reasons for it, but he suspected that it was for the same motives that the Poilus were kept away from cities throughout the war. In his own words, it was so that they wouldn't be surprised by the multitude of what they called embusques, shirkers that avoided their duties and the dangers of the front, and that could be seen walking carefree on the streets. It was so that they wouldn't frown at the sight of the excess, the luxuries, the coquettish attitudes and the attire of many of the women, and, at least in appearance, the almost universal gaiety, the seeking after of entertainment, pleasure and amusement all of which were insults to the soldiers' tragic fate. Despite its close proximity to the front, Bethune continued its active, normal life. This would last until the Germans eventually despaired of taking the town, and made it go through the same fate as Verdun, Reims and Arras, to be consumed and demolished by war. After the soldiers returned from Bethune, and during those four days of rest, Barthas notes that a few shells fell on Anneka and claimed victims among soldiers and civilians. He also noticed for the first time that in front of a house where someone had died, a few flowers in the shape of a cross with a laurel branch in the middle had been placed. It was a small gesture, but it had touched him. When Easter Day came, they were in the trenches. There was nothing different from any other day except that a mass was carried out ten meters from their front line at a place the Poilus called the Wash Bowl. This place was a depression in the earth of about a hectare, 
in the shape of a circle. It was surrounded by a protective parapet two to three meters high. If one was safe from the bullets there, one was not safe from bombardment. But despite the place being well known to the Germans, who had once occupied it themselves, Barthas never saw a single shell fall inside it. The washbowl itself was a central part of life in the trenches. All around it, elegant cabins had been built with grassy lawns and flower beds. These were the quarters for the officers. On that field, the men had assemblies, built barbed wire emplacements, worked with wood, and even played rugby. The Germans would have been blind to not see the ball fly in the air and sometimes land way out ahead of the front line, inside the barbed wire. On these occasions, a brave player would go out into no man's land to get the ball, testing the courtesy of the Germans, who never fired on the players. On Easter Day, an open-air altar was improvised right on the slope of the washbowl, with a front line running right behind it. A chaplain said the mass, which was sung by the officers and especially by a lieutenant called Cordier, whose booming voice Bartha says surely reached the German ears. The commandant and almost all the officers attended the mass, while all the soldiers who were not on guard duty were allowed to go, though Bartha's remarks that only most officers attended, because their captain Hudel was definitely absent taking every opportunity to show his antipathy towards anything and everything religious. But this time his anti-clericalism went too far, and he made a mistake which could later be used against him by his adversaries. The 21st Company was in reserve in a support trench, and at the very time that the mass was taking place, the captain ordered a roll call and imposed a sentence of two days of prison on the approximately 30 soldiers that were not there. The Commandant Garceau, who had himself given the authorizations for everyone to go to the Mass, begged and pleaded with the Captain to lift the sentences. But the Captain would not budge. In the end, these prison sentences were fictitious anyway, because when they stood down for rest periods, he did not make the punished men stay in the trenches, as the inhuman regulations demanded but the damage was done nonetheless. The captain said to one of the punished men, a corporal Gélisée, that he was punishing them for being absent from the trench without authorization. But the corporal simply replied, Captain, there's no use hiding it. We were punished for going to mass. We know it. To wipe out the bad impression left in the company on that occasion, the captain offered up on May Day at company expense a bigger meal than usual and, out of his own pocket, some cakes and cigars. On the package made up for each squad there was a label that said to the non-coms and soldiers on the occasion of May Day, the holiday of workers who suffer and who yearn to be free. But Bartha says that this gesture by their captain did not arouse the slightest enthusiasm did not stir any souls or awaken the conscience of any soldiers. According to him, they had lost any sentiment of dignity. They felt their morale had been taken down to the level of beasts of burden. For Barthas, no one could dream of social emancipation or universal fraternity when their reality, their present, was so horribly depressing. They were stuck in the machine of war and doomed to a hideous death or wounding, or long months and years of unimaginable suffering. They had lost all faith or hope, and now were nothing more than miserable wrecks. On May 4th they were back on the front line, and there was a noteworthy incident. It was 11 p.m. and it was a very dark night. Everything was completely calm. Their squad, the Minerva squad, stood watch. Men were stationed every 20 meters. From the middle of the sector a sap about 30 meters long ran out towards the enemy lines, and at the end of it two sentinels, Mondier and Airy, stood watch and listened. The two men found the long and monotonous hours at their listening post incredibly boring, so they decided to have some fun at the expense of their comrade stationed at the entrance to the sap. 
They came running down the sap, pounding their feet and rattling their bayonets to give the impression of bigger numbers. They ran by their sleeping comrade and screamed with desperation. Gilles, Gilles, the Germans are coming. The terrified Gilles believed them and, in a fit of courage, decided to sacrifice himself and warn the rest of his comrades. Mustering all his strength into one great effort, he screamed for all to hear, To arms, to arms, the Germans are here. Immediately, the sentries nearby took up the alarm to go to arms. Rifle shots started cracking. The Germans in their trenches immediately replied at this, and white and red flares started to light up the sky. Cannons started firing on both sides and the fusillade grew, extending as far as Vermel, while at Anneca the alert was given to all companies that were at rest. In the trench, all those who were sleeping quickly poured out of their holes. Some leapt to the parapet and started shooting away at the darkness like madmen, while others decided that the loss of the trench was insignificant compared to the loss of their own lives and quickly started running away through the main communication trench. At the moment when Gilles gave the cry for alarm with such strength and desperation, Barthas was about 30 meters away, having a chat with Louis Allard, who had stepped down from his firing spot at the parapet due to the tranquility in the sector. No one expected an attack during such a dark night, and they were stunned when they heard the cry. Soon they heard a lot of footsteps running towards them. Shadows appeared a few paces away, and they had no doubt that the Germans were pouring into the trench. Barthas quickly jumped and was up on the parapet, but Allard did not react quickly enough and was knocked down and trampled. Once the human avalanche had passed, he managed to get up. But it had not been Germans that had trampled him, but terrified Frenchmen that were running as fast as they could as if the devil himself were at their heels. This stampede of retreating men ran along the communication trench and crashed with a section that was moving up rapidly as reinforcements. The officer at their head, with his revolver in hand, made them turn around. Barthos comments that if it hadn't been for the intervention of Captain Houdel, all those men would have been court-martialed for abandoning their post. The chaos continued, and everyone was firing away, with the only and strange exception of the two machine guns that were positioned at the center of the company, which were completely silent throughout the situation. It seemed that the machine guns were not working, which was unacceptable and would make it so that later a lot of inquiries, reports and sanctions were handed out. Meanwhile in this chaos, Captain Houdel arrived bareheaded and furious, with his loud voice, he dominated the tumult and screamed, asking what was going on. No one knew anything and couldn't answer. Barthas approached Houdel and told him that it seemed a practical joke had gotten out of hand. But, since men from Periac Minervois were involved, they should try to fix things up quietly. And, in the end, things indeed were fixed quietly but Barthas was impressed at how a false alarm had caused such chaos and such a waste of powder. On May 6th, they returned to Anneka for four days of rest. The next morning, they were put to work digging trenches around the houses in the town to serve as shelters in preparation for the very likely event of bombardment, because a big Anglo-French offensive would soon be launched. Batteries of big caliber guns were installed around Anneca and started to fire ranging shots, while ambulances started to appear in great numbers. These were all signs that a new massacre was in the works. The Poilus did not know what role they would play in that future bloody drama, and they constantly lived under the shadow of anxious expectation. On May 7th, at 6 in the evening, a shell knocked off a corner of the tower of the town's church. Another shell gravely wounded their commandant Garceau, a good man that the soldiers loved. Garceau was replaced by a man that all the soldiers ended up despising, a commandant Nadeau. Then, at last, 
on the dawn of the ninth of May, while spring was coming to life, a terrible storm began. But this was not a storm of lightning and thunder, but of explosive and shrapnel. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of cannons started firing on the German positions, from Arras all the way north to the Belgian border. The big offensive had begun. And on this note I shall leave you for now, with the first part of this notebook, the second one will come soon. Until next time.